Thank you, Deacon. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Bless you. We are good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. 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 On this Sunday before Christmas. And uh, it's good to see everybody. Amen. It's good to be seen too, right? That's right. Amen. Amen. We're going to, we just want to uh, give, give uh, thanks to the praise team for all that you do um, and, and ushering in God's spirit within us and preparing us for the word. Thank you for um, all of the activities that's play, taking place. Thank you, Sunday School. Miss Bradley for bringing forth the Sunday school message. And, um, uh, we just we've just been blessed this day, and uh, we're gonna continue on with this uh, theme of Christmas today in our message. And the title of our message for today is Biblical Truths of Christmas. And our title scripture is found in the book of Isaiah, chapter nine, verse six. The book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6. And this is uh, a verse that gives prophecy about the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. As the Lord gave it to the prophet Isaiah. When you get there, say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. All right. Praise God. It says, Isaiah 9 and 6, it says, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Yeah. First part of that, part of that verse talks about, for unto us a child is born. We know that Jesus was fully God, but he was also he had a human side to him too, he's fully man. So in order for him to come into the world, he had to be born as a child to come to us, right? But like Miss Bradley also said, but it says in the second part, it says unto us, a son is given. So Jesus being fully God, he is the pre-existent son of God who was given to us. He existed before the manger. Amen? He was already the God's son before that. And so his son was given to us. And then it talks about the government shall be upon his shoulders. God is in control of everything. Don't think what's going on on Pennsylvania Avenue is controlling what's happening. God is in control. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. That's what it talks about. And then the last part of verse 6 describes who Jesus is. And, 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 I, and, I, and as I see the, the, the wonderful counselor, I see that word omniscient, all-knowing, right? When I see the mighty God, awesome God, mighty God, I see omnipotent, right? The everlasting Father, I see omnipresent. Because he's ever present. He's here, he's there, he's everywhere. Amen? And then the last one, it, they describe him as the Prince of Peace. They call it in the, in, in the Greek, they, they, uh, they, they call it Shar Shalom, which means the commander of justice and peace. This is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who is the reason for this Christmas season. Amen? Amen. But I'm going to tell you something, church. 
We've experienced many perspectives regarding what, what Christmas is during our lives, you know? And I wanna, I wanna share with you probably two of the most prevalent perspectives that we experience um, in, in, in this world. We, we have a secular, a commercialized perspective on Christmas, and then there's a religious perspective. All right? Let's, let's talk about this secular perspective of Christmas. Santa Claus, right? The lights, the decorations, the Black Friday sales, the before Christmas sales, the after Christmas sales, the during Christmas sales, you know, watching Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer cartoons, Charlie Brown, right? Frosty the Snowman, The Grinch, that was one of my favorite, The Grinch that stole Christmas, you know? Back when I was growing up, they used to have on the local TV station, Santa Claus used to come on, they used to have a segment right after school, when we got home from school, Santa Claus used to be on there, he used to read letters from kids that would write letters to him, and then at the end, he would have this like, this magic telescope, and he would look out, and he would, he, would, he would say the names of the kids that he could see that was watching them on TV. And then he called your name, he's like, ooh, I believe he, he saw me, mommy, he saw me. <laughs> 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 Waking up in the morning, two, two, three in the morning, opening up gifts, you know, Leaving cookies and milk for Santa on the table, you know? Playing outside with your friends, riding your bikes, playing with your remote control cars and so forth. Outside, eating some good food, family. That's, you know, that's, that's a perspective. There's also a religious perspective. And, and as I was growing up, most of the Christmas teaching that I got came through participating in the annual Christmas Day program. Mm -hmm. Right? Y'all remember that? The play, you got Joseph, you got Mary, you got the shepherds, the three wise men, we're gonna talk about the three wise men a little bit later, the innkeeper, and of course, baby Jesus, right? And we'd be practicing for a couple of weeks, trying to memorize our line, mama fussing at us. Boy, you better learn your lines. You're not going, you're not going to embarrass me. <laughs> <laughs> trying to remember all the songs we're supposed to sing. You practice, and then the, then the day comes, and you, you, you have the, 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 this, this performance, and you, you, uh, you do the play, and then afterwards, Santa comes. Santa Claus comes to church. And he does the big gift exchange. Everybody can gets, gets their gift. If you exchange names and you get the gifts, and then you don't never leave back. When I grew up, I grew up at the church I went to when we grew up. You didn't never leave the church after the Christmas program without two bags. You had a bag of candy, you had a bag of fruit. They had some apples, you had some oranges, you had some nuts. And some peppermint, that's right. That's right. That's what we had. You know, and, and, and a lot of times, and this is my perspective, a lot of times Christmas was viewed, instead of a current event, it was more focused on a historical event, and that Jesus was kind of portrayed as a historical figure who God sent to be the savior of the world. But there was a, there was a lack of teaching on how his power not only has the ability to save us, but his power also has the ability to renew our minds and transform our lives. Not a lot of talk about that piece, you know. And he 
he'll do that. He, 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 that same power that brought Jesus into this world can renew our minds and transform our lives if we allow him to, right? And this religious perspective didn't honor Jesus as a present day reality for our lives. It just focused on his birth. And I'm not saying this, we gotta tell the whole story. I'm not saying that what we talked about was wrong, but we need to tell the entire story. We focus on the birth and we forget about his life because he, not only did he, did he live then, but he, he lives right now. Today, he's at the right hand of the Father in heaven, but his spirit lives in us. We got to talk a little bit more about that. Think about it. When it comes to your birthday, somebody, Miss Brad, you got a birthday coming up in May next year. Do you, June? Sorry, June, sorry. But do you, do you, do you just reflect on the birth, your birth on your birthday? No, you reflect on the life. Everybody understands that. You don't, you don't just focus on the birth. You focus on your entire life for your birthday. Why do we focus on Jesus' birth? Just his birth. Think about that. Today, we're going to share some biblical truths of Christmas. I'm going to give you five. There's a bunch of them, but I'm just going to give you five. We'll cover the next one, maybe next year, as the Lord sees fit. But I'm just going to give you five of them. We'll cover some more next, next, next year. But I believe that the secular perspectives of Christmas and the religious perspectives of Christmas are constantly being fed at us. Constantly. We're seeing it in, our, in the media that we receive on TV, on our social media. And what, and what happens is this, because it's being, the, the, the secular perspective and the religious perspective of being fed, we don't, it, it, it overshadows the true meaning of what Christmas really is. And as a result, we've got a whole generation of adults, we got multiple generations, adults and children, who have little to no knowledge on the true meaning of Christmas. And, and, and they either haven't heard it before or uh, some of those have heard it, but they chose to reject it, you know? And, and these are, many of these people are folks who are struggling to find joy, to find peace, to find contentment in their lives. And Pastor Spradley always teaches us this scripture from Hosea 4 and 6, it says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We got to have knowledge of the true meaning of Christmas. And we, we as adults, we, we, we're, it's our responsibilities to tell our children, to tell our grandchildren the true meaning of Christmas so they don't, they don't fall into that same trap as so many people do today. We're going to cover these five biblical truths that our Heavenly Father reveals to us in the Christmas message. And I hope that these truths um, inspires faith in your life, pers personally for your life, gives you hope and, and love in Jesus Christ. And I hope these truths empower us to change our lives for the better. Amen? Amen. All right. So here's the first one. First one, and first one, I'm gonna actually break this one up into two pieces. There's a 1A and a 1B. And let's start with 1A. 1A is God loved the world enough to give us Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. God loved the world enough to give us Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Lord and Savior. He's the greatest gift that. God gave to the world. Church, our greatest need in life 
is to be loved, if you think about it. And what the funny thing about that is, don't we look for love in all the wrong places? We look to our spouse, we look to our kids, we look to our family, we look to our church family, we look to our careers, we look to our business, we look to our clubs and organizations, and we would rather allow the word, the world, to feed us its definition of love instead of taking time to seek God's word to understand what true love really is. The, the scripture teaches us in 1 John chapter 4 that God is love. God is love. Love is not God. God is love. Love is who God is. He is the source of love and the only place where we can find full, truly find fulfillment. He fills in those voids in our lives. Amen. So let's go to 1 John. Let's go to 1 John chapter 4. We're going to look at Verse 7. Start at verse 7. First John chapter 4, we'll start at verse 7. All right. You there? Jesus, Lord. All right. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that lo loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Verse 9, and this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, the acceptable payment, the atonement for our sins. This is a key point when you go through this, this verse, these verses. God's gift of Jesus Christ to the world was his expression of love to all mankind. God's gift of Jesus Christ to the world was his expression of love to all mankind. And God demonstrated his love for us by sending his son Jesus into the world to deliver us from the empty promises of false love and sin. God's love for us is eternal. God's love for us is unconditional. God's love for us is irreplaceable, church. His love came first. And the, and, the, and, the, and the thing that, that's uh, interesting about it, he gives us the free will to choose to love him back so that we might live through him. And I'm going to tell you something, and I've said this before, sometimes he'll love folks straight to hell. They had the free will to choose, but they chose not to. He's expressed his love to us, church. Key point number two as we go through these, we looked at these verses. One B or two? This is just a key point, another key point. Yeah. God gave us Jesus in order for us to have a proper relationship with him. Right? In Genesis, we know that when Adam sinned, it caused a separation between God and mankind. When Adam sins, he gave, he gave birth, birth, sin was given birth and it became part of our nature. We were born into sin, right? As the scripture says, we didn't have any, we didn't have any choice in the matter. God understood that and he provided a solution for us. What the first Adam broke, the second Adam came in and fixed. And that was Jesus Christ. 
We know he was fully God, but he was fully man. And he was sinless. And his sacrifice to suffer on the cross and overcome death enabled us the ability to have a correct relationship with our Heavenly Father. Jesus paid the debt for the sins of the world. That's why it says this. He was the propitiation for our sins. And one of the things that I want everybody to understand is this. Having the proper relationship with Jesus Christ is the greatest and the most important relationship we will ever have in our life. Think about that. Having a proper relationship with our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ is the greatest and the most important relationship we can have in our life. Do we take that for granted sometimes? So I, I, I want us to think about that. There's a scripture, I'm not going to have you go there, but I want you to write it down so you can go back because I know I'm going to try to get us out of here. Um, 1 Timothy 2, chapter 5. I mean, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 talks about this Jesus being the mediator. It says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom from all to be testified in due time. Jesus is the mediator that brings us in the, into the correct relationship with Yahweh. No other religion can do that. I, you know, Muhammad did what people can say, Muhammad, but what did he do for your sins? He didn't do a, he didn't do a thing. Jesus to address this issue with sin. No other religion can say that they can do this. One God, one mediator. Key point number three before we move to 1B. God gave us Jesus Christ so we could receive the free gift of eternal life, which results in an everlasting relationship with him. God gave us Jesus Christ so that we can receive the free gift of eternal life, which results in an everlasting relationship with him. This free gift of salvation is available to everybody. It's all exclusive. Nobody gets left out of this invitation. Everybody gets the invitation. And, but we have to receive it by placing our faith in Jesus Christ and by, we, we, by, by placing our faith, by, by confessing, by believing in our hearts and confessing with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, this enables God's grace to come and we receive that eternal life. That's the grace, of, that gift of eternal life and that everlasting relationship comes as a result of that church. We know uh, what John 3.16 says in and it describes, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world. He came, to, he came so that the world through him might be saved, church. And I think we understand this that first 1A part. But the other part about Christmas that we don't talk about is 1B. And that is, 1B is Jesus demonstrated his love for the church by giving us the Holy Spirit. So you got the prerequisites 1A. But for us who are saved, who all already who are disciples of Jesus Christ. We need this 1B. We need to understand this 1B. It says in 
Let's go over to John 14. We talk about that. John 14. We'll go there. John 14, we'll look at verse, start at verse 15. Sometimes we want to leave Jesus at the, at the manger. This one be is a game changer for believers, for, for, for Christians, for disciples of Jesus Christ. John 14, 15 says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you a, another comforter. That comfort is in capital C. That's the Holy Spirit. That he may abide with you. When, how long? Forever. Even the Spirit of truth. That's the Holy Spirit too. Whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. This is, this is the game changer right here, church. When you, once you receive Jesus Christ and you come into the relationship with you, he gives us the Holy Spirit. This is the same spirit that Jesus had in him when he was living here on earth. Those who place their faith in Jesus Christ have access to the same spirit that Jesus operated in. Amen. His, his spirit enables us to overcome the power of sin in our lives and operate just as Jesus did when he was on earth. But you know what we do? In the Christmas story, we leave Jesus at the manger. But we never, we never talk about the part that he grew up. When we are born again, we're a babe, just like Jesus was a babe in that manger. But you know what we gotta do? Just like Jesus did. Jesus grew up. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. So that we can no longer be a babe in Christ, but that we can be mature Christians, mature followers of Jesus Christ. That's the goal, that's the end goal. But so much of it, so many folks wanna stay at the manger. The story goes beyond the manger. We got to remember that church. And this is one thing. This, this, the Holy Spirit makes us, gives us a competitive advantage over the world. But the sad part about it is so many people that they don't know have knowledge of the Holy Spirit. They have something they don't even know how to use it. And they, and they, and, and they fall into that trap and they respond just like the world responds. We're, we're, supposed to, we're supposed to walk differently than the world, right? We're supposed to be a peculiar people. We're supposed to be sanctified, set, set apart. Walking in the Spirit, operating in the Spirit allows us to do so. But the key is this, and I'm going to tell you something about the Holy Spirit. He is a gentleman. He's not going to force you. He's not going to beat you upside the head. He's not going to tap you with that ruler. Mm -hmm. He's a gentleman. He's going to give you the free will to choose whether to follow him or not. All right? Second biblical truth for Christmas. We, we taught this in Sunday school. With God, nothing is impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. Things that seem impossible with man are possible with God. Right? That, that should give somebody some peace. That should give somebody some encouragement to know that. Luke chapter 1, we're going to look at verse 34. Start at verse 34. This is a passage, y'all. We talked, we covered this in Sunday school. It talks about Mary and Mary, the angel coming to Mary and telling her that uh, she was going to be the mother of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And uh, Luke chapter 1. 
And we're going to look at start at verse 34. You know, and the angel, you know, basically told her, um, Gabriel told, told her that, you know, God has found favor with her and, and she was going to conceive in her womb and bring forth a son. And, and then she was going to call his name Jesus. And, he, and then, you know, Mary received that word from the Lord. And then she says in verse 34, Luke 134, Mary said to the angel, said, how shall this be? Seeing I know not a man, I haven't been with a man. How am I going to have a, a child? I just need to, I need some clarification. Yep. And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the high shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And then it says in verse 36, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the, is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And then verse 38 is the game. This is what, how Mary responds to the word. Mary says, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me, according to thy word. And the angel departed from, from her. We just read about the birth of Jesus Christ from how it was going to take place. The angel Gabriel had given Mary revelation. And so God used the power of his word. God used the power of his spirit to conceive a child in the Virgin Mary's womb, but it couldn't, it couldn't take place until she received it by faith, right? This passage gives us revelation knowledge that when we know and when we understand God's plan for our life, you know who the only person that can stop it is? The person we look at in the mirror, we look at in the mirror, it's us. God said it. It's going to come to pass. And if you don't fall in line with it, you know what? He'll give it to somebody else. But, but you know, his word, like his word said, his word would not return void. He's going to make it. It's going to perform what, what, it, what he said it was going to do. It, it will accomplish what it was set to do. We have to understand this with God. We have the ability to manage through anything that comes our way. We talked about this in the contentment series. This knowing this should help us, give us peace, and be content because we 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 walk in the fact that we know what God's word says that I can manage. I can get through all things through Christ Jesus, who strengthens me. And our faith in knowing what God's word says gives us access to that grace to do those impossible things. Amen? All right. Third biblical truth. And this is something that I, I believe, I, I see it personally that um, we, I think folks struggle with. Walking in integrity is profitable. Walking in integrity is profitable. We're going to go to Galatians chapter 6. And we're going to look at verse 9. There's, in our world today, there is a perception in the hearts and minds of our society that walking in integrity is not profitable. That righteousness doesn't win over evil. Or darkness is better than light. But when I go to Galatians chapter 6, I'm going to start at verse 7. Galatians 6 and 7. The word tells me otherwise. And I believe what God's word tells, tells us. Because it's never failed me. And I know it will never fail you if you put your trust in it. And apply it in the, in the proper manner. It says in Galatians 6 and 7. Be not deceived. 
For God is not mocked. For whatsoever the man soweth, that shall he reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap ever life everlasting. And verse 9. And let us not be weary in well doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You gotta have some perseverance. You gotta have some patience. Church, we can't cave in to the pressures of life when we see other folk who aren't serving God doing better than we are in the natural. First of all, we shouldn't be looking at it in the natural to begin with. We are eternal beings. Yes, God blesses us with eternal things, but we need to, what we need to be concerned about is those, those eternal gifts at the end, because those are eternal. Oh, so-and-so got the new Escalade. Oh, they got the new... Why are you worried about that? If God wants you to have it, he'll give it to you at the right time. If that's what he wants you to have. Maybe he wants you to have a flip phone. <laughs> we got to look at things from the spiritual. Sometimes those things that think we think are blessings for those other folks may not be blessings. The enemy could be putting them in a the, in the bad, sending them down a, a, a spiral, all right? So that's not just, we can't look at things from the natural point of view, church. If we look closely in the Christmas message, we see that walking in integrity is profitable. And I'm going to give you an example of some people who were faithful, who chose to serve the Lord and were rewarded in due season. First person, first couple of people, Zacharias and, and Elizabeth, right? We talked about them earlier. We, we, and we said, we talked about this in Sunday school. The scripture tells us in Luke 1 that they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the law, blameless. Mary, we just read in Luke 1 about Mary, who had found favor with God. Her husband, Joseph, which the scripture says, who walked in reverence and obedience. And in Luke 2, we see a man by the name of Simeon, who was just and devout, and God promised that he would live to see Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. These folks were not considered to be well-known people during that time on earth. We know them. Because we, we, we've got a word that, that, that gives them their stories. But they weren't famous. But God used them in an extraordinary way to usher two of the greatest men that walked the face of this earth. The forerunner, John the Baptist, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Church walking in integrity will secure for us the true eternal treasures of life. You want some? You, you want to have some treasures right here on earth? I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you a good treasure. Peace. Woo! Isn't it nice to have the peace of God on you? Isn't that priceless? Contentment, joy, the joy of the Lord, God, godly wisdom, grace. The power to be delivered from things that are coming upon us, being bold in our faith, health and prosperity. And this is a key point before we close out on this one, because I want us to be sure we get this. Because some people, they lose sight of, of walking in integrity, what it means. You can't walk in integrity for a couple of hours and expect God to overflow you with some blessings. You can't be walking around, oh, I've been good for five minutes. Where my blessing? That's what we do, though. Walking in integrity.
integrity should be a lifestyle. And we should have faith in knowing this, that God will give us that blessing in due season. All we got to do is be patient, continue to walk in it. Amen? Amen. Fourth biblical truth of Christmas. Humble beginnings are not bad. Humble beginnings are not bad. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. And um, it's talking about Jesus. I'll, I'll start at verse 6. Philippians 2, verse 6. He said, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him in the form of a servant, and he was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You see, sometimes, church, we, we can feel defeated based on what we begin with in our life, you know. We can be the low person on the total pole at work. We can be, you know, our, our, our first office for our business may not be the most technologically advanced. It may not be the biggest office. We may not have all the clientele, but we have to remind ourselves that little in the hands of man can be turned into much in the hands of God. Little in the hands of man can be turned into much in the hands of God. Think about what happened. Wasn't the disciples deflated when they came to Jesus and they brought the two fish and the five loaves of bread? But guess what happened? They forgot who they was rolling with. Jesus Christ! Sometimes we gotta, we gotta be reminded. We gotta remember, who am I rolling with? I may not have much now, but if, I, if I'm a good steward of what I have, I know in good season God gonna bless me. With some more. That's the thing about humble beginnings. A lot of times we, we use that as a measuring stick, you know, of what our future holds. We can't do that. Jesus, we talked about it this morning. Jesus was born in a stable. He wasn't born in a palace. He was laid in a manger, a feeding trough for animals. He wasn't in a crib like most of us was in or in a bed, a normal bed, you know. Jesus was worthy of being born in some place, but that's not how God planned for him to begin his life on earth. Think about his triumphant entry to church at the end of his life. Was he on a great horse? No, he was on a donkey. Think about his death. Was his death something that, that people, no, nah, it wasn't. It was, it, was a, it was a horrible death that many of us, would, we can't fathom. With our, with our natural eyes. But we see that these humble experiences led to Jesus being exalted highly. Jesus began his earthly life at the manger, but now he sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Humility leads to exaltation. Humility leads to exaltation. And humility is a priceless competency we can't afford to live without church. Humility opens the door for God's grace to flow to us. God can take what we have. He can multiply it if we learn how to be content, if we learn how to abide in him and learn how to abide in his word with faith and patience. We can't let pride seep into our hearts and shut off that grace because that's what pride does. It blocks that grace because we need that grace to manage our lives each and every day. I heard somebody say this once and it stuck with me. They said, one day of God's grace is worth a thousand days of human effort. Mm -hmm. Glory. One day in God's grace is worth the time. It's probably more than that. It's immeasurable, church. 
Church of God, allow our faith and humility to rule our hearts. And once when we do that, we'll be witnesses of God's grace being supplied to us. All right? Last point, and we're going to close, is the fifth biblical truth of Christmas. And this is wise people know what to do. Wise people know what to do. We're going to go to Matthew, and we're going to look at Matthew 2. Go to Matthew chapter 2. And we'll start at verse 1, but I'm going to skip around. I'm going to start at verse 2. No, verse 1. Matthew 2, verse 1. And you get there, say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And after this part, King Herod heard what they said, the wise, the wise men said, and he wanted, he, 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 he was offended. He, he, he felt threatened. So he's on a plot to kill Jesus. So he brings them in and talks to them. And we're going to skip over to verse 9. And he, he wants them to come back and tell them where Jesus is when, when they find him. So they leave him. In verse 9 it says, And when they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. So many of us, we, we, we've seen this. We've seen the nativity scenes, right? People put up these really beautiful nativity scenes and we see Joseph, we see Mary, we see the shepherds, we see the three wise men, false. We see the livestock. Some of us, they even have Jeep Santa Claus in the, in the nativity scene. I've seen some that have that. All gathered together at the manger, beholding the baby Jesus, right? Some of them even have SpongeBob sitting at the manger. It's a shame. And, and see, the thing about it is this. Tradition has taught us that three wise men were present at the birth of Jesus. Wrong. That's not what the word says. First, the scripture refers to them as wise men. They didn't give a number. We just know that they're more than one. Right? No count is given. And in addition, closer studies indicate that these wise men were not present at the birth of Jesus. When they arrived, Jesus was around two years old. And we know that's because they're living in the house now. That's what the scripture tells us. They're not at the manger. They're at a house, and they're referencing Jesus as a young child, not a baby. Wise folks know what to do. Wise folk know what to do. These wise men from the east received revelation from God that a king had been born. They saw a star in the east and left their country to search for him. And when they found Jesus, I'm going to tell you what they did. They rejoiced with great joy. Great joy. They worshiped him and they honored him and blessed him with expensive gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Boy, they got something at the bed and body work. It's called thankful. It's a it's a it's a it's a body, body, body washing and notion. You know what he got in it? Frankincense and myrrh. And I told him I gotta get some of that because I won't smell like Jesus. <laughs> and that's what I got it on today. I'm smelling just like my daddy. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. These wise men understood how to approach a king church with worship. And part of their worship was bringing gifts. We can't come to our king empty handed. First thing you know, we need to give the king ourselves. We need to give him ourselves. That's a gift. He gave us Jesus. You know what he wants from us? He wants us. You know something else that we can give Jesus? Our time. Our talent. And our resources. But it first starts with giving up ourselves, church. The other part of worship 
is giving praise and thanksgiving. And we need to find, we need to follow that example that the wise men shows us, teaches us in the scriptures. And I'm going to tell you something. When we recognize who Jesus is, not this fake Jesus that many of us, so we, we, we say we, we recognize, when we recognize who the true and real Jesus is, we should respond with a sincere rejoice. We should respond with a sincere worship. We should respond with a will to follow and obey him, church. So many folks come to church today and they perform all these spiritual, these religious rituals, but they still don't recognize who Jesus really is. You say, Pastor, how do you know? Because they don't have a will to follow him and obey what his word says. I'm not saying you don't make mistakes, but you gotta have a, it's a pattern of disobedience. I'm not saying we're going to, we, we got to be perfect. We're going to slip in there, but we have, there's some consistency. We're constantly moving, trying to renew our minds and trying to operate with the mind of Christ. There's folks, some folks that don't care. That's what I'm talking about. How can we recognize if, how can we recognize Jesus if we don't take time to know him personally, church? How can we recognize Jesus if we don't spend time with him on a regular basis? Don't be fooled like so many people are today, church, and not recognize to rejoice, not recognize to worship, not recognize to bless the Lord. If some of us are unsure of our ability to recognize Jesus' presence in our life, I'm gonna give you an I'm gonna give you a scripture you need to go to and meditate on. It's Jeremiah 29, 12, and 13. And that scripture says, In those days when you pray, I will listen. And the scripture says, if you seek me wholeheartedly with a sincere heart, you will find me and I will be found in you. When we seek God sincerely, church, he will reveal himself to us and we will experience his love and grace like never before. Like the song says, like never before. Won't you fall in this place like never before? Praise God. Hallelujah. Wise men, wise women, wise children are those who faithfully seek and serve Jesus Christ. Church, I hope these biblical truths have Help to see, help us to see, or to remind us about the true meaning of Christmas. The Christmas season is not just about celebrating Jesus' birth. That's part one of it. But celebrating his life. And more importantly, it's that his life is being made alive in us at this very moment, church. On our challenge today is to ask ourselves, are we responding in obedience to what Jesus has made available to us? Are we executing this plan and purpose for our lives as his word teaches us? Are we displaying the fruits of the spirit in our walk with him? Let's close out. We got one more Sunday. Let's close out 2019 by assessing these questions, church, so that we can be ready in 2020 to take our relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to another level, another level of intimacy. Amen. God bless you and Merry Christmas to you all. The door of the church is open.